something that Nikki Fielding taught me is the word allow. Okay. Allow yourself the time to invest in you. It's not okay. selfish. Uh, self-care is not selfish. Allow yourself the time to enjoy each day. Allow yourself that time to invest in you. It's not selfish. Allow yourself to, to reflect oh, the word allow, mm -hmm. because most of the people who are going to be watching this are going to be very driven individuals, very high achievers and very successful in the world of business. And they oftentimes don't allow themselves the gift of the day. Every day is a gift. We need to allow ourselves to receive it. And if we can do that, we can have a much happier life, a much more successful life, and be at a better place with our mental health and even with our physical state. So allow. If we can do that and receive it, the ability to receive. I struggled with that for too many decades. Every day is a gift. I need to allow it to be just that. Welcome to the Self-Funded with Spencer podcast. Healthcare is broken, and we aim to fix it one conversation at a time. Well, John Troutman, Mazzetti and Sullivan, how are you, man? I'm doing great. Good. Did I, did I pronounce it right? I you, it did. Okay. you did. Okay. Like Thank I you was, so much. Spencer. I'm always, I don't ever do anything <laughs> scripted other than do I get the company name right? And it looks like I nailed it. You okay. nailed it. Awesome, man. Right out of the park. And I may have a little bit more of a gravelly voice today. I apologize. I know you and I were at conference this week and we interact with a lot of people and who knows what's, what's. That crud That's all right. We can around. we can roll with it. We're, we're, hey, are we six feet apart? I don't uh, know. If I'm we're, not we're, sure. We can get a, a tape out measure. Yeah, but YouTube. we're good. But how you doing, man? Thanks I'm for doing traveling. Fantastic. Man. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here, and you're a great human being. And oh, thanks, man. I'm a people over everything person, so to be here with you is, is an honor. So well, I definitely want to like go into that people over everything uh, yeah. mentality and what that fully is. I know you were telling me just off off uh, camera a second ago, but talk to me about your travels this week. We were both at Benefits Pro, right? Yes. So we we're both in Austin this week, but you've made some other travels around that trip as well. So you're kind of hitting a couple cities. So where all did we go on this particular trip? Yeah, I love wrapping uh, other opportunities or creating opportunities whenever I go to a city. So uh, being in Austin, just wrapped some opportunities, meeting with some, again, some fantastic individuals uh, down in San Antonio. Uh, so I had three meetings down there and then back up uh, yesterday evening to up here, back here in Dallas, meet with you and We'll mention any names, but it sounds like Steven Snyder. Okay. Uh, so uh, with him, and then I have another meeting this afternoon. So just try to wrap things around either before or after an, a scheduled event makes it a lot more valuable than just the event itself. Well, that's the beauty of Texas too, right? I mean, you can hit San Antonio and Austin and Dallas, and whether you fly or drive, they're all relatively close proximity where you can make it one one you know one day in one city and one day in the next city and and really get a lot out of it. But what I was curious, that was my first benefits pro. How, how many times have you been to their expo before? Uh, this is my second. Yeah, okay. My second one. Yeah. Well, that was my first impression. Fantastic. You know, oh, yeah. Fantastic um, event. Like we were just talking about, it's like you never have enough time to go to everything you want to. But I remember seeing last year in San Diego, everybody was raving about how awesome it was. And I had a little FOMO, you know, the fear oh, of yeah. missing out. And yeah. so I went this year and it was everything I, I expected it to be. Yeah. Is that one you hit every year? Or you it's try it's to a do? must. Paul Wilson does a fantastic job. Yeah. Um, all of the presentations, it's it's. <laughs> there's so much valuable content you're going to get. If you, you you'd have to have your ears plugged not to not to walk away better off. There really is, and great people that are presenting. Um, it, it's it's for me. It's a must attend. Uh, it really is. So it's, and it's shout out to Josh Butler for broker of the year as well, man. That, that's exactly right. Super well yeah, 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 very, very, very much so. I've, I've been following that guy for uh, probably a couple years now, uh, virtually, right on mm -hmm. LinkedIn. We haven't fully connected. He did come into Austin and do a mini episode with me there. Obviously, he was there for the the other reason. But it's like I I've wanted. He was one of those guys I've wanted to get on the podcast so long because all the stuff he puts out online is just brilliant content. Yeah. His strategy, he's very open about it. And so you know, from what I know, it sounds like the uh, not nomination and the win was was very well deserved for him. Yeah, and that's and I, I I agree with you with the understanding of everyone who I was submitted to be a part sure. of that list. I mean, just I don't know how they do it. How do you get you know that number of those people together that are such uh, excellent individuals doing such a fantastic job? How do you pick one? Yeah, ultimately, I mean, you have so, to yeah, right yeah, you by have design. To. But right, yeah, it's right. like all of so, them are certainly well deserving. Yeah. yeah. So John, uh, I want to talk to you about. Um, we'll talk about Mazzetti and Sullivan. We're going to talk about the EAP world and yeah. everything that encompasses. Uh, but before we get deep into the product and deep into the solution and kind of what you believe in there. Let's talk about who you are, man. I want to get some of your background. Like, yeah, who is John great. Troutman? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that's a very deep question. That's probably a loaded question, but start me a little bit of your history growing up. We were talking weather a minute ago. Yeah. Wanna, yeah, hear about your upbringing and things like that. 
Yeah, so married with four kids and uh, for almost 30 years, and uh, I've been around the sun 51 times, so okay. it depends how far back around the strips you want to yeah. you want to start yeah. off with. But um, from a professional standpoint, uh, I was a pastor for about 20 years, uh, and since we're going to go down the realm of uh, mental health, I'd, I'd really like to start at that point. Sure. Um, and the reason for that is this. Uh, I've always been, uh, long before Scott McGregor came up with People Over Everything and the Talent Champions Council, I was a People Over Everything person in mindset. And uh, being at the same church for the same time, I've always been uh, very persistent. You know, we talk about what type of superpowers you may have as an individual. Mine's always been persistence, okay. staying the course to the point of maybe being belligerent sometimes. <laughs> and that's where that was. Yeah. So uh, I'm certainly I'm not going to get into all of the bullets of while I was at that one church. Um, but I would be that person that, uh, because of being people over everything, take your cell phone on a vacation with your family. Uh, you never really shut it down, like yeah. totally yeah. shut it down. Yeah. And over the course of time, you end up at the same church. You end up not just marrying individuals in the family, you end up burying people yeah. in that same family. Yeah. And I genuinely cared about, uh, well, I still do, to those, about those individuals and that loss really took its toll on me because yeah. I never had the time. And if I did have the time, Spencer, I never took the time. I didn't understand what it meant to really process a loss, to go okay. through the grieving process. I had it in my he up here in my head. I didn't apply it from my heart of, of going through and reflecting back and looking at those things. So the course of time of, of just about 20 years, um, I was not at a good place. Uh, I, I found myself driving down the road, driving past a certain home where a I had uh, buried someone, you know, been a part of their funeral proceedings, and I was very heavily involved in the community. So this isn't just like a clerical, you know, yeah. you know, thing. I was I was very invested in the community from from baseball teams. I was a part of an organization that uh, we built a baseball field where there was a, a soybean field. So it was a sort of a field of dreams thing. Okay, truly, cool. so it was. So that was cool. you know, it's a shout out for Eric Silverman, a big baseball fan. So we did it, you know, and it's great to be a part of. But I never processed the reality of those losses. Well, did you feel like because of your obligation as a, a pastor that you um, felt like you had to deal with the business of it all? And obviously there's the spiritual component, right? Sure. And you're helping people comfort them and assurance and stuff like that, that you didn't even actually get to spend time on yourself uh, because clearly you were close to these people, right? So you were outpouring everything you could to other people, but not necessarily, you know, reflecting on your own grief and things like that. Is that, is that kind of how, how it all went down? Well, I'm going to go there and I'm going to be very transparent. I know I may step on some toes here, but I'm trying to speak to your heart, people's hearts. Please. And the reality is I think a lot of people who would coin themselves as followers of Christ, when it comes to self-care, they look at it as being selfish. Okay. And that's what, that was me. So okay. I, you okay. know, at what point in time are you, you know, doing enough for God, you know, and for everyone who's listening or watching this, you know, whoever your God may be or whatever your faith may be, where is that line drawn where it's enough? And for me, it really never was enough because I felt like I needed to be that, I see. that servant. So um, taking that time for self-care, I understood going to the gym. I've been going to the gym for a long time, some more disciplined seasons than others. But, uh, and when I burned out, and uh, I had a friend tell me, and maybe I didn't share this uh, yet. If I did, I'll just say it again. I was told to take a six-month sabbatical. I laughed in his face. Okay. Because I was a, I've always been a workaholic. If you yeah. find an opportunity to do what we enjoy, I'm all in. Yep. So I never, I laughed in his face. Within two months, I was, I was uh, rightfully so asked to step down. Okay. And I need, and I needed to. Okay. They, they, I do not look back any longer. Um, I did go through a whole victim process and everything until I realized the whole victor mindset, okay. choosing the solution, looking for the reasons why I had to go to counseling. I lost my position, lost a lot of things because I didn't take the advice and let, let's just call it what it is too. People who go through burnout don't always see what's going on because yeah. they're so entrenched in the flames. Um, and they're and they're so committed to whatever that task or things are that 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 they're burning out. They don't listen to those voices they should listen to because they're not in a good place. Well, so how did it manifest where other people were starting to recognize the burnout? Because as somebody um, is sitting in my position, I, you know, I'm, I'm about to be 40 this year, and I'm you know pedal the metal, right? I was yeah. going to say something else, but I'm pedal the metal right now. And, uh, you know, I, I think about this often, right? Is how to get out in front of, um, before you mm. realize you've gone too far, right? Yeah. Or when is it appropriate to, to pause and what are the signals or symptoms that you should recognize when you're getting just too much, right? When you haven't really paid attention to yourself and given yourself a break. So how did that manifest in you? Just out of curiosity, what you can share. This yeah, so podcast is brought to you by True Captive Insurance a premier medical stop-loss captive for employer groups ranging from 25 to 1,000 employees.
True Captive believes in health care that is personal and insurance that isn't complicated. That's why they take a white glove approach, making it easy for employer groups to transition into a program built specifically for them. Check them out at truecaptive.com. This podcast is sponsored by PlanSight. PlanSight is a technology for employee benefits brokers to more efficiently manage their RFP process for any group size, all funding types, and over 20 benefit lines and point solutions. PlanSight is the only end-to-end RFP technology on the market today. Let's modernize your RFP process together. Check us out at PlanSight.com. Yeah, so two things. Number one, I'll, I'll say uh, this right out of the gate. I drive a Lexus, and I'm not saying that to brag about that anyway. I'm saying I'm anal with its care. Okay. So I'm supposed to go, and every 10,000 miles to get it there, I'm calling that dealership ahead of time so that it's there at the right time. Okay. I Oftentimes, we as individuals take better care of our vehicles than we do with our own mental health. Sure, sure. And that was me. So when is a good time to do that, to give yourself an evaluation? Today. Yep, yep. Don't wait until you, you have to ask or have other people look in to, to your own state to do that. I wasn't ever doing that. So right out of the gate, I didn't put a priority on my mental health. Okay. So it wouldn't have mattered. I was raised, so and I need to give a little back of context to this. Yeah. Not everyone is raised with the level of a work ethic uh, that you and I were. Mm-hmm. So to me, it, was, it, was, it defined who I was. Yeah. So I, it was it was always uh, that extra load was I was embraced. It was a part of who we were. So how it manifested in me was I became incredibly calloused. Um, I can say it here because because no one else is going to be aware. That's just you. And, it's just you and I here talking. That's right? it. So, yeah. <laughs> so nobody's going to listen. So I'm actually a softy. I genuinely care about the people that I work with. My okay. strategic partners become like family to me, and that can be dangerous. But again, I became calloused and cold and, and a lot more standoffish okay. to the people that I was close to. So my family members who are who have a higher EQ were aware of that. The ones that didn't weren't aware of that necessarily. They just thought it was a bad day or bad moment. But they reached out to me and said, "Hey, you know what? What's going on? Is yeah. everything okay?" And no, everything things fine. You're feeling this, this burning inside, but when you're the one going through burnout, you can't really assess it. Yeah. You don't really see those things and feel those things until it, it reached a day. Like I said, I was driving down the road, um, for no apparent reason, just, just, I lost it. I mean, I just crying for no, no reason. And I knew I needed help, but because of my position, I was hesitant to get the help of what others might think of me. Man, that's great. It's, it's wild. And I don't, I, I understand what you're saying. Mm-hmm. Right. But it's like, even the people that need you know, the p- people that are in a leadership position mm-hmm. or th- authoritative position, they sometimes don't know how to like be vulnerable or they, mm-hmm. you know, yourself included, where he's like, I don't even know how to ask for help. I'm scared to ask for help because how does it reflect on me as a leader? I'm supposed to be leading other people, right? And, you know, that's, I, you, I was asking about symptoms. The things that manifest in me is get a little tired, right? I'm, I'm less mm-hmm. in, energetic than normal, but I get grouchy sometimes. I don't know if you're like me, where it's like <laughs> you're just stressed and tired and overworked and it manifests itself as being sort of short-tempered mm-hmm. and grouchy. And I catch myself uh, right. doing that, but it's like, man, you start reflecting, is this who I want to be? Well, if I'm doing this often, well, clearly that's a symptom of something further down the line right. that's causing this, right? And so just trying to be conscientious of it, but I'm, I'm talking to you just sort of right. openly about it because it's something that I've recognized on a, a sort of temporary basis that occasionally it'll manifest. And I'm going, well, okay, all right, maybe this is the, this is, these are symptoms of that, right. right? And just understanding that. So when you got forced to hit pause, mm-hmm. And you said you had the victim mentality for a little while oh, yeah. for the first couple of months. Then how did you start processing? How did you come around? Maybe was it like a grieving process, like a death almost, where you had you went through those stages a little bit? Yeah, and um, and, and again, I for me, I, I equate it to, and I'll just project an imagery out there of a scene from Lord of the Rings, right? Okay. When when the one king, which I can't recall his name, is is looking at, he's being invaded, and he's saying in that moment, "How did it come to this?" Yeah, right. Here we are at the end of all things. And truly, when you are 41 years old, when you've burned a career, you've burned your relationships, and you're standing at those gates, you feel like you're at the black gates of Mordor. Okay. And that's where I was. And I, yeah. and I had to realize, how in the hell am I going to get out of here? Okay. Because I don't know all the things that got me here. I was told, don't ever burn out, but I didn't know what it would look like. Yeah, yeah. But then I found when you lose your career and you don't have a whole lot of options in front of you, 
um, it's black. Yeah. And I didn't make a lot of good choices when it was black. I made things worse. Okay. So okay. I can even speak to those things. I'm not, you know, uh, as well. Well, I imagine, but, uh, you know, like, so I'm thinking about, let's see, tomorrow my career was stripped away from me, right? Like maybe the, you know, plan site goes away, podcast goes away, start straining the relationships and family. My whole identity effect effectively mm. goes away. And I'd have this, like, who am I moment, I'm yeah. sure. And I'm sure it wouldn't be the healthiest of reflections. Yeah. Um, you're welcome to go in as much as you want. But I mean, obviously, there's a there's going to be a processing process. This is almost mm -hmm. like the hero's journey. I I've talked a couple times about the hero's journey here recently where it's like the world as you know it today, we always start a movie there and then within five or 10 minutes, the hero all of a sudden gets thrust into a new world or their current world is stripped away and now they have to go through this kind of uh, um, reconciliation process of finding themselves. So did you go through a lot of that yourself and uh, did it manifest in some unhealthy ways, I presume? Yeah, well? and yeah. I'll speak to those because I think, I think most people who go through those things uh, when it comes especially to mental health um, there isn't really a manual. We all deal with things differently. We all respond to them differently. And there's different, uh, burnout can manifest itself in different ways. So okay. just because I went through it to the level that it was considered extreme burnout doesn't mean that everybody will. Okay. And it can look different, differently for them. For me, once I got to that point, I lost my career. Um, I doubled down on, on my, what I perceived to be self-care, which was doubling down on alcohol. And I okay. became an alcoholic. Okay. And, my, and my intake was such that my monthly expense exceeded my mortgage. And Jeez. it took, uh, and that only got me to darker places yep. because I kept reliving, uh, life isn't fair, why did this happen to me? And you became this pointing, finger pointing, blaming mm -hmm. aspect. And I will share this story. And um, I did get the help, so I'll say that I'll, I'll lead with that. But Please. sitting at the kitchen table, around 12 o'clock at night with everyone asleep and having consumed way too much wild turkey for the how many of day in a row, yeah. um, sitting there with a handgun saying, that's it, and squeezing the trigger and it didn't go off. Are you serious? Right. So this was a, so I'm an, I'm an NRA life member. I've been around firearms my entire life. I've cleaned my firearms. I've never had any issues. I've never had anything lock up or anything like that. But that was the night I was like, I'm done with this. I can't believe this. And I was ready to just end it. And the gun locked up. Um, and I was, it was a wake up call. It was a yeah. slap on my face. It's like, you know what? There's nobody to blame here but me. Yep. And I'm a, I'm a better person than this. I need to start taking those steps, no matter how small. So that's when I put that handgun away. I've intentionally never fixed that handgun. That Smith & Wesson is still in my gun case, but it doesn't work to this yeah, day. Yeah. And I'm going to keep it. That's a reminder. I'm, I'm here for a purpose, and I am so passionate about helping others get out of burnout and deal with mental health solutions. Um, that's my purpose, and that, that is ultimately why I'm doing what I'm doing. Well, so you're talking about a why, man. I mean, it doesn't get bigger than that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, uh, you know, I was a, a God-fearing man as well. I mean, like, it's hard to argue that there wasn't an intervention uh, at that moment, right? Like, how did you have other weapons you could have chosen, right? Like, I mean, was... Oh, I could have had, had a... Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you chose yeah, the one exactly. that malfunctioned. I mean, that's, right. uh, like, dude, that's hurting my heart, but I'm glad that, that the outcome was what it was. So then yeah. that was your rock bottom, presumably, right? So this is where hopefully we turn the corner. So what did you start to do to come out of that? So I had to... So what I did in that moment was I decided to, um, to get the help that I needed. I was tired of going, trying to get out of it my way. Uh, one of the things with people who are very resilient is they're usually self-starters. And, and I know this audience who's going to be watching, listening to it is a lot of high Ds, a lot of self-motivated individuals. As you said that earlier, high D. So uh, drive or, or what? So on the DISC scale, a okay. personality you know, profile assessment, DISC, you know, okay. those individuals who are, are high D, you know, uh, you know, it's easy to not want to take help from others. That, yeah. That's, you know, okay. every everyone's strength can also be their weakness. So okay. those who are the self-motivators, easily, you know, self-driven, if you will, don't don't look for those other insights okay. or, that, or that feeding or coaching for that matter. Mm. So I felt that I really didn't need that help. I was going to get out of it, get out of it. And that was the day I decided, I don't care. I'm going to make 1% myself, 1% better every day. And I will make progress mm -hmm. by God, as my witness, I will, I don't care what it feels like. So that's when I doubled down on going to the gym every day, regardless of what it felt like. I've got chronic Lyme's disease. And some of those days after too much alcohol, it was not pretty. I bet. So, uh, but I, I some days crawled out of bed to just walk to the end of the road to get some exercise. Okay. So every day I doubled down on 1% better. I will get out of this spot. Some jobs are going to be terrible, but I'm going to leverage my position. I'm going to leverage what I had to go through to be better down the line to make a better impact in people's lives. So did you seek help though? Like from I did, absolutely. Yeah, so yeah, what, so how I, did you, how was the process of like humbling yourself to go, I need, I need help from somebody else. Yeah. How so we do that. So for me, the best solution was getting out of my environment. And what I mean by that is I left my house 
Okay. I went to a counselor in North Carolina, which was several student states removed, of course, from Pennsylvania, where I live, and I got the help. And I doubled down. I stayed there for several months, um, and I just – I only focused on me. After 41 years of excluding myself from the equation, yeah. I only wanted to focus on me, yeah. and I needed to fix what I broke. Interesting. Okay, so once you got out of there, then you go, all right, well, what do I do now, right? And yeah. I think that was obviously where, you know, we were going to pick up from a sales perspective mm -hmm. where you started uh, almost over, right? You started from yeah. the ground uh, up again. So now we're out. Now we feel like we're healthy enough to kind of be back home, right? So then what is the process of going out and finding meaningful work again and kind of building yourself back up from the ashes? Yeah, and at that point, I reached out to, again, I've always been a relationship-driven person in business and life. So um, for me, I had to reach out to my inner circle, which at that point in time, I burned a lot of those relationships, but there were several individuals that said, you know, we'd be willing to give you an opportunity in sales. One was uh, an individual at uh, a radio station, which we can or can't go there, but that's fine. I wanna, I love to hear, uh, we're on a so, podcast, we might as well talk about radio. So okay. we, we went to, uh, so one individual said, you know, why don't you come, we'll give you a start with the newspaper industry. Okay. So um, the irony of it all, was I leveraged the relationship to start a sales career because I was told at 41, if I told you before, I think it's important for others to hear, I was told by a CFO here in Dallas um, that my resume was no different than a stay-at-home mother. Really? And I don't mean any disrespect to stay-at-home moms, um, but when you're 41 years old and you've been a professional for, for about 20 in one place, that, it's a hard here, okay. right? It's a hard... Uh, data dump. Was the, the message at least that they didn't know where you would start in terms of like transferable market skills, yeah, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's what and she, meant, said, uh, yeah, she said. Yeah, she meant well. She was, she, you know, is a good friend. She's like, what am I supposed to do? Well, well, I don't know where you're, you're going to go from this. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know what, because I, I sought her for advice. She's like, you really can't take this successful two decades and just roll it over, okay. over to this, right? Yeah. So she's like, you're going to have to figure it out. Well, did you know you wanted to go into sales though? Um, did you have that? like instinct at least, that that's what maybe you could be good at? So I leveraged my knowledge of sports and I've always been a coach of, okay. I've always been a coach since I've had kids. So for, you know, that, that almost, at that point it was almost 20 years of coaching. I just leveraged what I did with coaching a player. I had to coach myself, okay. which is we'll go with the strengths of the individual. Okay. And we're going to develop our team plan with the strengths of our team and, and leverage that. So I've been a presenter for, you know, almost 20 years, very comfortable in front of an audience. That's when Mazzetti and Sullivan EAP also said, hey, we'll give you a side position to be a presenter to our larger clients. So I, I took on public speaking to their larger groups, um, whether it was a group of attorneys all across Pennsylvania, whether it was for something with uh, Capital Blue Cross. And I did that on the side in addition to starting sales and marketing career, which, um, again, every position along those ways helped me to this point. Yeah. So. Um, so in that, if you were to take one song of that whole thing, because you and I both love music, and yeah. I, we have a wide, we both appreciate a wide range of it. Yeah, for sure. Um, that that uh, Brothers Osborne, that that younger me song, okay. right? it just totally resonates with me because I'm only here today because of what I perceive to be as a nightmare. Yeah, leveraging yeah. And, and making the most of those opportunities, opportunities, not obstacles. That well, was the learning. Point. How long was it before this transition into this new career path? that you said Mazzetti and Sullivan came in and you were presenting first before you were kind of a full-time employee, but was there other jobs in between that? Was there sort of, sort of like some yeah, so, low, yeah, lower end of the spectrum entry level sales jobs or what were you Yeah, doing? I worked for a radio station for a year and God love the manager there who took me on. He knew I was a speaker and he thought I had a great radio voice. You know, I, I, always I, thought, I always thought I had a great radio do. face. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so, no, he took me on and it was a lot of fun. It was great. I learned a lot of things, a lot I learned about. And he, his whole philosophy was the, relationship model of providing solutions. Okay. He would say, John, I need salespeople, but you got to understand you're a solution provider first. You need to listen to people. And he taught me the art uh, in, in the business world, because as a pastor, I was also a counselor, okay. right? My phone was always blowing up with people's just dumpsters fires, right? Yeah. So, but in a business sense, he's like, John, you need to understand to roll that over, be that same good listener in the business. And okay. you've got to uncover those things. So you're there to provide marketing solutions. So that was huge in getting in the marketing space. And that was about uh, nine years ago. So okay. a few months in to, to when I was lost my position, uh, he took me on and it was a great experience. I loved being on the radio, loved doing, creating the ads, create, you know, any type of ad. So uh, different voices, all, all types of things. So I'm not going to necessarily replicate those. Oh now. man, okay. <laughs> You know, I'll, I'll, I'll spare you to have to pull one of them out because that's like when everybody, some, somebody hears I do stand up in the past, they're like, oh, tell me a joke. And it's like literally the worst environment I know, I know. To, to try to tell a joke or make somebody laugh. 
Um, so, so, all right. So the radio that obviously didn't work out, uh, you know, let's just call it flash forward right into the, sure. the, the Ms. Eddie and yep, Sullivan yep, World yep. EAP because part of my motivation to talk to you is not only get to meet you in person and thanks for coming down here, man, but two is like that space is really foreign to me. I mean, I hear things just in passing. It gets mentioned on occasion, but I don't know anything about it. And I don't even know the good side and the bad side of that world. So, so catch me up to EAP, Ms. Eddie and Sullivan. What are you doing? And maybe how does that differ than what people traditionally believe EAP? Did? Yeah, that's, that's great. Great. So it was what, what got me into that space of, of being with Mazzetti and Sullivan, EAP, was they took on um, the EAP embedded plan with Capital Blue Cross. Okay. Uh, they, they were in business at that point for about 35 years, never had anybody in full-time marketing. I'm going to do a fast forward here and say I went through seven different positions in about nine years okay. of, of marketing. Okay. Again, all of those things um, helped me and understanding and gain the background of what works, what doesn't work, and how to engage things to um, even places with dealing with TV ads, billboards, all that stuff to, to get and to be involved with Ms. Eddie and Sullivan AP from the marketing side. So they brought me on and it was, a, so first of all, it's a different universe in selling and marketing, um, mental health, and even with, with advising. So I went from a space and a success ratio of 20 to one, 20 emails to a response. Okay. So to that, to 500 to one. So again, it was, it was this process of a, of a massive learning curve, uh, which is totally different in the insurance space from my experience than what it was in all the other things with marketing. So I had to figure that out. Um, EAPs, I'm going to jump to the mental health yeah. side to get back to your question. EAPs are such a wide brush that it, could, it was a real challenge in marketing who we are because we were a white glove provider of the service before advisors called us white glove heavy on human interaction, okay. not so much technology. Yes, we have technological tools, but it's the human side. So communicating that in a world where the whole, and I'm, I'm just gonna speak from on behalf of me here, so um, my own personal view of the whole situation, yeah. I'm not throwing any other provider or competitor under the bus, but I'm gonna call it as I see it. I believe that the, the mental health space, a lot of those providers out there are in, intended to be not used. Okay. That's how you can make that money. Or they, would, or they would be doing things differently. I say that sincerely not attacking because um, they're, they're tucked away. They're not talked about. They're not engaging the people. And if you want to take these concepts that I'm, that I'm going to be speaking about, fine, do that. Because at the end, I'm not going to move this bullseye. You and I talked about moving a bullseye yeah, earlier, yeah, yeah. and I'm not going to move this bullseye. I want to see mental health solutions provided to the masses and that they use those plans that are in place. Yeah, what good is are they if they're not utilized? Right? Exactly. You, said, you suggested perhaps some of them are buried, right, and whether or not, you know, that you know how, how that actually is done or if it's done intentionally or if it's maybe by design of the product, but it's a revenue stream at the end of the day. If it's, right. not, if it's not utilized, then it's obviously the margin are higher. But you know, what good is a plan like this if it doesn't get used? Um, so I want to make sure at least even define its employee assistance program, right? Is what Correct. the AP stands for. I want to make sure if anybody that hasn't heard that term um, understands what it is. But tell me, let's talk about the application of EAP in a perfect world. I want to hear the Mazzetti and Sullivan angle to it. But if EAP product itself, what is it positioned to do? Who's using it? And how is it best utilized? That's great. So there's there's no such thing as an ideal group for it. Everybody needs it because it's mental health, right? So starting out there, um, everyone needs mental health solutions, whether or not you're going and getting assessed for it. I'm not saying, and, and the stigma that can be there is you think things really need to be my situation that I talked about earlier, yeah, right? Yeah. It, it shouldn't ever get to that point. Right. We take our cars, we should do that to ourselves when it comes to maintenance and care. So everyone needs to use it. And so that should be that should be on that HR top of the list. Okay. That should be on that advisor top of the list. Because if you're going to make that impact in a person's brain, mm -hmm. It's a person's brain you're talking about in their mental state. So okay. being able to make that investment of what it really is as opposed to, oh, well, we can't talk about these things and feelings, right? I'm not afraid. Listen, I'm not a small person. I'm not scared to talk about my feelings. I don't care. Yeah. And I really don't care what people think about me for telling that story. Mm -hmm. So um, we need to be more open. And I think if, if the leadership that's out there in companies, if the leadership in the advisory world um, can talk and be more open to share their own story, who hasn't had a situation in life that's gone sideways? Yeah. And there's no one exempt when it comes to mental health. We all go through hardships. We all go through challenges. Why aren't we talking about those more and how we 
how we went through those difficult times, that's a part of the mental health story. Well, and like you said, the, the, the idea of those products is to intervene long before it gets to the point, like mm-hmm. you said, that you got to, right? Since somebody doesn't have to be in as a dire of a situation mm-hmm. to benefit from it, and the intent would be to, to intervene long prior to that happening, right? So that doesn't ultimately result in that situation, um, and hopefully, you know, not a worse outcome than happened to you. So then what do we, you know, give me some examples of things like stress, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, work-related stress, money-related stress, maybe, you know, mental health in general, obviously. Obviously, depression is a fairly common um, state of being for some folks, even the young folks. Obviously, we've seen an uptick in that. But like, what would I use it for? Maybe a common example of what it gets you. Yeah, I'll give you a common example from what my friend Robert Steele said to me. He's like, John, well, you're 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 providing any life challenge, and okay. really, uh, those EAPs that are out there should be for that. Okay. So who's exempt from a, from a life challenge? So Nobody. EAPs yeah. are there for for mental health, but really, you think about those different things, whether it's things with your kids or whatever. Those things can can add up if we take care of all those life challenges with the proper care, thought processes of, of, of thinking and reflecting on those things and mm-hmm. doing that and, and putting things into practice, you and I work out on a regular basis yeah. physically. Yeah. You know, it took me a while to realize I need to invest in that time of reflection, meditation, and invest in my mental health that way. Yeah. It's a different it's a different thing, but it can also be added to your physical health to to really be much more preventative and maintaining good mental well, health. Well, so I mean, even just like having somebody to talk to, right? I mean, I like right. sometimes just having somebody to bounce an idea off or what I'm going through at the moment. I mean, is there anything where they would say, no, we don't, we don't, you know, is there anything too small to discuss with an EAP counselor? No, no. There really, I mean, now maybe there are some out there, but I'm, I'm trying to be broad and say okay. for all those that are out there, I'm not speaking specifically even to us, even though we do, that should be the case for all EAPs. In okay. an ideal world, you should be able to call, contact them for anything because yeah. it's that, and you and I spoke of this earlier, that one degree of separation. You know, if you can realize, hey, you know what? I'm off the track. You don't see that one degree yourself. Yeah. Right, but to get that life coach in place that can see these things and say, hey, you know what? What if you did this or provide those suggestions? It's going to prevent the massive burnout. Yeah. Right. Well, I want to, I'm curious, you know, did you meet Nama or are you familiar with Nama, uh, the one that runs the meditation stuff? Yes, I, I, I saw her Benefits Pro. I absolutely small L love her. Yeah. And uh, she's a great individual. So she's been very helpful to me in practicing and implementing meditation as okay, well as- Okay, I was going to ask, yeah. Yeah, as well as mindfulness and self-reflection. Sharon Tiger has been very helpful to me as well over the years. So uh, getting with getting with the right people to invest and allow them to breathe truth into you yeah. is, is huge. That's amazing. Well, yeah. And I, I got to have dinner with a group and Nama was there and mm-hmm. you know, I was really fascinated by her, you know, drive to implement a, like a, an employer based yeah. uh, meditative solution, which yeah. is really cool. And it's something I, I've been fascinated and I've dabbled with in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, so like, how did that change your ability to be more present or, you know, kind of reflect? I mean, is there, do you have a regular guided meditation you go through? Is it a daily practice? Like, how are you kind of involving that in your life? Yeah, so I tr- I've I've taken my own version of the atomic habit, you know, the habit stacking thing, okay. it's, it's, which it's a little different than it's described in the book. But for me, I it's a real with my personality type, uh, Spencer. It's just really hard for me to to augment and, and specify this. This time is going to be for my mental yeah, health, right? Yeah. So I've got to habit stack it. So for me, uh, I I don't leave my gym until I take that time. Okay. I don't leave the gym until I take time for mindfulness or some stuff. Is this in the sauna or something, or where where do you have that? Okay, reflection? I'm going to go there, and I don't care. Yeah. And I know Ryan Miller will eventually wa- watch this and die laughing again. <laughs> 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 and I can handle it, so that's okay. So I tan for multiple reasons. Oh yeah, I remember you saying that. Okay, okay so I do that for um, I have psoriasis. Okay. It, it it's that UV light does wonders uh, for me, but also it forces me to not move. <laughs> so I'm okay. a high D, I'm a high yeah. I. Uh, I, I, it's hard you for me just to have to be still. It's hard right? for me yeah. to sit still and I got to be in a place. Guess what? When you're inside that bed, you're not going anywhere for yeah. 10 minutes, yeah. right? So, so for there, I'm stuck there and it forces me to go through box breathing. Okay. I take four minutes for box breathing okay. and I also go through self-reflection. I go through those seven chakras and as well, I know it's not the normal time. It's probably a lot of for people, but being a D and an I, I can't do the whole hour long thing, okay. right? So okay. it's, it's a much more simplified, very focused, while I'm in here in that seven minute time, taking a minute in each of those chakras and getting rid of those things, focusing on uh, things that I've been disappointed about myself, those angers, the things I couldn't let go, those things were um, hurt and all those things, you're going through the, those various chakras and and getting rid of them because yeah. just because we 
may take time for self-reflection doesn't mean we're not going to allow them to come back. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you talking about, I was having this conversation with somebody the other day about, um, there's a, a tool song that like, you know, the band tool, right. Yeah. And there's a song called the grudge and that, that song talks about you giving away the grudge, right. And the grudge in this element or this instance was, it's like an anchor weighing you down, right. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to let go. And it repeats that let go, let go a lot in the song. But I was like, man, that's like, I at, got to a point where I realized like, forgiveness, you know, the inability to let go right. of certain like things in your life, right? Like just the letting go. My wife's going through um, a moment now of sort of accepting of grief with her father passing. Like that grudge, if you hold on to it forever, it's going to weigh you down. It's going to be like an anchor dragging you to the bottom right. as well. And I, so just that something you said just a moment ago triggered me around that. Uh, <laughs> Always a good time to bring up a tool lyric, in, in, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah. Well, back to the EAP <laughs> subject, because I don't want to miss the opportunity to talk about, you know, you guys appear to have a really good participation rate, a really mm -hmm. high utilization rate, which is like you said, as you want, that means the product's right. working. How have you been able to go about that? How do you guys get a lot better participation than the normal EAP? Yeah, that's great. And thanks, uh, because I'm here for the overall perspective of uh, mental health, but to, to speak to our brand, that, yeah, that's Yeah, I would love huge. to. I, I mean, just, I definitely want to so. hear it. Yeah. So we're seeing nationwide uh, our average utilization is just under 20%. We're about 19 point something, and that fluctuates, you know, by the day, of course, with all the groups. But um, the biggest success piece is is having an assigned, dedicated client solution specialist. Okay. One person, and uh, that person is going to not just report to the group. They're gonna. They're supposed to build a business relationship. Okay. And what that means is, just like a sales, not there to sell anything. They're there to understand so they can use the services to its fullest extent. That means having personalized trainings, presentations that are going to speak to those things, those challenges they're dealing with, not just merely drive them towards counseling. Okay. Yes, they're there as well to tell about those opportunities and, and to engage that HR person on a on a quarterly basis. So what the, our differentiator is this, we're relationship driven. It's a heavy, expensive process. Okay. And there's a lot more EAPs out there that um, are probably a lot more cost effective when it comes to operations, because okay. they're not doing that 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 person touch. Um, there's no commission structure within Mazzetti and Sullivan EAP, but there's a very small profit margin because our operations side, you're gonna get a white glove feel without a white glove fee. Okay. So we're competitively priced. So that's um, one of the challenges we have is because we're so heavy on the human touch. And that's why I'm passionately going around the country meeting with strategic partners. Okay. Uh, because I want to be there. I want to build that relationship. I don't want to sell a product. I'm here for the solutions and the relationship. Well, and I mean, with your story, right? I mean, you've kind of, you, you've you walked the walk, if you will. It's not just mm -hmm. something you're selling. And like you said, you're not even commissioned to sell it. Um, so then it just makes it where you get to share your story and maybe how it would have helped a person like you, even somebody, the high D, I mm -hmm. know you keep using that term, a yeah. uh, high D would have benefited from it. So as this space evolves, right? You have virtual primary care. There's some other mental health solutions out there. What does the mental health um, space look like here in the, in the near term? I mean, even coming out of COVID, maybe how did that mm -hmm. change? change um, this business model a little bit. I like to hear kind of maybe the future looking of what mental health means, especially in an employer-based style arrangement. Yeah, I see the greatest challenge nationwide really is the provider network. Okay. And again, I'll, I'll speak in a very broad brush way. Uh, in the world of that EAP, we talk about providers. Uh, what, who are My question is, if you're looking for an EAP, you should be asking yourself, what does that mean of a provider network? Okay. A lot of EAPs will say that they're licensed, certified. What does that mean? Uh, again, if I may just take a a differentiator explanation. Sure. We only use uh, master's degree clinicians okay. that have been vetted for five years. Okay. And I will be transparent. It is a challenge right now with the demand that's on mental health. Yeah. yeah. Um, finding those individuals um, because they're also being overwhelmed with work. Yeah. So they themselves need their own services. They need to find somebody else. So it's a it's a demand. Wow. Okay. Beyond I didn't measure. think about that. Yeah. So these individuals are, are are caregivers, if you will, in some ways to, to so many taking care of their mental health, helping them be healthier, but yet they themselves need that help. So it's, it's a real stress on the entire network. And there is a, a great rise in people. I'm just going to call it the way it is that are underqualified. Okay in that field. And they, pr you probably shouldn't be in that space. Look at the disclaimer on the website of the app that okay. you're considering buying for the group. Okay. And if it says these are not, and it goes from there or it gives you a warning, you need to consider that. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. You really do. And I'm not, I won't mention any names, but I would not want someone unwilling, unknowingly, you know, put their group at risk by just merely because it's an easy app or it's an accessible tool. I'm not yeah. saying they all are. I'm not throwing them all under the bus, but I'm saying that's something they should all know about is look for those warnings 
at a website. Yeah. Go to the bottom of the page. Well, let's say you, you're, you're talking about you needing help somebody to talk to, right? And if you sort of um, depersonalize it, if you will, where it's like, how do you actually get to a person? I need to talk to a person, right? I don't mm-hmm. want to necessarily solve a problem through an app or solve a problem through a video I watch. Is that really going to solve my problem? Maybe to some people it will. But ultimately, to be able to bounce ideas off of and get sort of intentional help based on your circumstances is really it sounds important to me, right? Um, but I don't know. I don't know your space all that well. So maybe there is a there is an application for those uh, abbreviated uh, style versions of mental health as well, right? Yeah, and I need to be clear. I'm not throwing mental health solutions carte blanche under the bus that are technology driven, okay? Yeah. Because at the end of the day, some some solution is better than no solution. Let me let me be very clear and upfront with that. Yeah. And I am not trying to to throw anybody under the bus and then therefore help my ship rise. I am not doing that. I am concerned about the end user getting the best solution. Absolutely. Period. Absolutely. And and to me that means getting something where you're going to have a a qualified certified person be working with you for your mental health. So that they'll deal with everything because oftentimes people will go for that tip of the iceberg reason. And that was just the last draw, whereas yeah. you had the rest of this iceberg that you've never dealt with of many different things. And it was this last thing that made you do and acted out this thing. Well, we'll get you excited about the future of the space, if you will. I mean, I know you're passionate about it, but what gets you excited about perhaps where this industry is going? Is there anything that you're, you're latching onto that seems like, yes, finally, we're doing this? Is anything like that happening? Well, yeah. So finally, a lot more people are talking about it. A lot more people are open to it. And you're not being given that double look when you bring it up. Like, yeah. oh, no, we're going to go down this road. Okay. There's still going to be stigma. And I don't, I don't, my personal view is there's always going to be stigma, right? Mm-hmm. Because just because of that, the good news is this. And here's what I'm so excited about. The younger generation is so open to this. Yeah. I am seeing almost no stigma at all in them. Yeah. So there is, um, again, we've got a lot of clients in the South and I'm hearing from their families. Oh yeah. My kids go to counseling. They're seeing their life coach and it's a normal thing. Just like you would go to a, a coach in your sports team or, yeah. or you're working out uh, coach, whatever that may be, your fitness coach. So there's a total different mindset shift from people who are my age, 50 or older, where it's like, oh, no, 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 we, we need to have that in there, but you know, we don't want to talk about it. We're not going to give examples. We, we know emotions. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Uh, why would I talk about feelings here? This is work, you know? So um, those who are n- not in tune or not open to be talking about that, it's just a, there's a total, it's like a new tide. And I know Lester Morales wants to use that a lot with rising tides and everything. And I love that illustration. There is a new tide turning right now okay. in mental health. And it's exciting to be a part of that process of uplifting everyone else to get a better version of themselves. Yeah. That's what you mentioned, like the generational shift, right? I think the the kids that grew up, you and I preceded iPhones, right? We preceded having cell phones all together. Um, the kids that grew up where that's all they've known, right? And mm. this idea of sharing everything, which I get, sometimes it gets into the oversharing realm. I mm. think it's almost like this challenge that they have of like, how much can I share of, of my life and be vulnerable? But I think that openness to sharing just in general in the social media realm means, well, that if they can destigmatize a lot of things in my life, well, then what's any different about mental health? Mm. Or So I appreciate that. Maybe that's probably one of the positive things of this economy where everything just gets shared outwardly um, to everyone. Um, speaking of that subject, though, I want to shift gears a little bit. You share quite a bit in social media world. Um, you're an a- avid LinkedIn user. Mm-hmm. I really like waking up in the morning and seeing like your <laughs> 4 or 4.30 a.m. posts, man. I always know John Troutman's got something good for me in the morning. When did you start being sort of intentional about social media strategy to help your personal brand, your company brand, or just maybe just get yourself out there? When did that start? Yeah, when I realized I sucked in marketing. <laughs> okay, fair enough. So when was that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah so yeah. it'll be four years ago okay. um, when I started at Mazzetti & Sullivan. Uh, I tried using the same system. If it, if it worked here... Let's try it there sure. mentality like a lot of us would do. We switch careers and it didn't work. Okay. And I'm not a loser. I am an overachiever and I hit those marks. So to, to have that, that challenge, I went to Vegas. I went to Benefits Mania. I met Andy Neary, Ryan Miller, uh, Eric Silverman. Yeah. Uh, and they very graciously took me under their wing. I'll be very brief. And just basically gave me, they didn't have to. Yeah. But they very graciously said, you know what? Be transparent. You may not want to tell your story. Spencer, you're not going to find me on any other social media platform. Yeah. I hate Twitter, book, snap face and everything. <laughs> right? So, but I'm there on LinkedIn. Why? Because it sells. It does. And it's successful. So I was willing to double down on myself and try that. And I followed that model um, in particular of what Andy uh, said to me of, hey, three times, it's a numbers game. I get numbers. I was a coach. I understand batting averages. Yeah. I understand foul shot percentages. Numbers don't lie. So 
I did the numbers three times a day. And for me, I want to be that encouraging shot of inspiration, um, shout out, get people excited about their day, being better about themselves when they wake up. Yeah. So you said three times a day, three times a day, three times a day. Wow, man, you're a machine. Yeah. And then like, uh, you know, as somebody that creates a lot of content, I'm just like in awe of that. Uh, but I, you know, it's such a regular, uh, you know, instance for you. I didn't realize it was that, that regular, but you know, the, the style of your posts, I start to get a feel of like how John Troutman posts, you know, the use of emojis, <laughs> the flow, it's always so good. It's like you writing these little mini stories all the time. And so has it just taken a lot of practice and repetition to get to the point where you feel like you've, you've honed in on your voice as well? Well, it, it has a figuring, figuring out what works and what doesn't work. I mean, and there's a lot of people that say that are very passionate about videos and it's kudos to you for, for finding what works, works out best for you. Sure. Yeah. Um, I went to school. One of the things, and it, it's again, every single person has enough content. It's about processing and figuring out how to leverage it for their success. Yeah. Yeah. I sat next to Jim Furyk in high school before he was in the PGA. Okay. He was a Mannheim Township. We sat in physics class and he said to me then, uh, cause I asked, cause I sucked at golf. And I still suck at golf. <laughs> and he said, figure out what works for you and with your swing. Yeah. It's what helped me get to be the best on that team in golf. And he, he's like fourth on the money list all time. I tried figuring that out. What's going to be best for me? I stopped doing videos. Okay. I don't plan my posts. Okay. I, I pay attention to what I'm dealing with today because yeah. I'm going to include that tomorrow. I'm, I'm given the gift every single day of content, of who I'm talking to, listening to their challenges, asking questions, okay. people sharing. And I've got enough content for more than one day. Yeah, I get asked a lot of time. When do you when do you plan these these posts? When do you do that? I don't. I don't have the time. Yeah, uh, and I say that very graciously and, and of, of gratitude for where we are right now. But I don't have the time. But I have the gift of content every day. If okay. I'm paying attention, writing those things down, taking notes, reflecting on it by the day. And then implementing it through the days to come. Well, that's just it. I, I sometimes uh, some of the most I see like I don't know, viral or most successful engagement posts I've had have been almost a spur in the moment idea and feeling. And it's like as I process it, I start to write it down. Then I'm like, oh, there's something here, and all of a sudden it becomes like a really, you know, kind of engage, high engagement mm -hmm. post. But it's not something I planned. It's not something like, oh, in three weeks from now I'm going to write about this. It's like, what am I feeling? What am I thinking about? What's a maybe? What is applicable to me in my life today that might have some, um, you know, uh, overlap with other people mm -hmm. and be worth sharing? And you know, you just kind of you get used to being comfortable, being a little uncomfortable, and sharing some things that are a little more, you know, out there mm -hmm. or, or uh, maybe could put to expose a vulnerability. But after you get over that hump, you're like, well, hey, this, I enjoy the process. It becomes a regular part of my sales process, mm -hmm. my marketing process, as well as just my own writing process. And it's a, it's a cathartic process as well. So, I mean, does it, does it serve that same purpose for you as well, just to put your thoughts on paper, if you will? It does. And at the end of the day, I've got two goals I want to accomplish in every single post. I want to inspire people and help them be 1% better. And that's why a lot of times I'll be talking about uh, the talent, cha talent champions. Uh, let me try that again a third time. Talent champions council, yeah, yeah. because it's all about people over everything. Yeah. And if I can have that be my focus, it narrows it down. So I'm not just throwing you know things out there because I I am given too much content in life in business. So figuring out how can I put that in something that's meaningful for my target audience um, to both inspire them and also also help them think about mental health um, to be one percent better. That's my goal. Yeah. If I can do those three things, I'm successful. Well, I'm glad you segued into that because I'm glad you brought that up again. And I, I almost forgot the people over everything mentality I see is a big part of what your mission is. So what are the origins of that thought process? And, you know, how to tell me what people over everything truly means to you in the way that you live your life. Yeah, so I am a big believer in in value, in adding value, in Gary Vee's model of jab, 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 punch. And, okay. the, and the jabs are throw value to people, give them value, give, uh, ask questions, understand the pains that they have. So what that means for me is being in my strategic partner relationships, asking questions to figure out what their pains are in business. Okay. It has nothing to do with mental health solutions, nothing many times, but then figuring out what can I do in my connections to introduce them to a better solution, to okay. something that's going to solve that challenge. Um, Eric Silverman very graciously introduced me to Scott McGregor and the Talent Champions Council. They, that is what they're about, period. People over everything. It's over 500 uh, global leaders um, at very high positions in corporations all over the planet Earth. Um, and every single week they're throwing out content that they're going to help me as well. I mean, I got the value back to me in a case in point, value, 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 right? So the value in being a part of that association, I get back. I got back with the first week. 
of what I pay to be a part of that group, okay. just by the interviews and the content that Scott McGregor puts out. Um, because here's the here's the reality: when you are a giver, you need to receive as well, or you're mm. you're going to be drawing from a shallow well. Okay. That's how I burned out. So, yeah. to get that regular inspiration myself, to be people overdriven, to get to get inspired, to get refilled, if you will, yeah. helps me keep going, and that's why I'm so. Uh, so passionate about the Talent Champions Council and people over everything because I get that that fuel that I need myself to keep going. It's one well, thing to do it, but to keep going. I'm glad you mentioned like that the idea of being able to receive as well. Have you read the Go Giver? Uh, I have. Yes. Okay, I was going to say. Yes. You, Thank I you so assume much. you read yep. that, but just people out there that are listening that maybe haven't. That is something that was uh, missing for me is like being willing to being okay to receive a compliment, mm. being okay to receive somebody you know sending you a thank you letter or without feeling guilty about it, right? Mm. Or just being open to somebody giving you an opportunity without going, well, why 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 do I deserve it? You know that imposter style syndrome. Um, the, that, the, one of the messages that hammered home there mm. is this, this salesperson that's trying to hit his quota and mm. go, 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 go. It's like, wait, well, what are you, one, what are you giving the market? But two, are you actually open to receiving something in return? Not that that's your intent, but that, hey, when it does come around, am I ready to receive? And just letting the world know, God, the universe, whatever, right. that I'm open to receive in return. And that's something that I've started to be a little bit better at in my own life as well. And I'm glad, glad you mentioned that. That's, that's, I appreciate that. So let's finish here, John. Um, I appreciate you, man. You shared an incredible story. And I, I genuinely appreciate you opening up and, and telling your, your story. Uh, but closing thoughts, man. I'd like to leave the floor to you for a couple seconds here. What is the message you want to deliver to the folks that listen this far? So I guess I, I really try to hone it down to this case in point, Spencer, and that is something that Nikki Fielding taught me is the word allow. Okay. Allow yourself the time to invest in you. It's not okay. selfish. Uh, self-care is not selfish. Allow yourself the time to enjoy each day. Allow yourself that time to invest in you. It's not selfish. Allow yourself to to reflect. Oh, the word allow, mm -hmm. because most of the people who are going to be watching this are going to be very driven individuals, very high achievers, and very successful in the world of business. And they oftentimes don't allow themselves the gift of the day. Every day is a gift. We need to allow ourselves to receive it. And if we can do that, we can have a much happier life, a much more successful life, and be at a better place with our mental health and even with our physical state. So allow. If we can do that and receive it, the ability to receive. I struggled with that for too many decades. Every day is a gift. I need to allow it to be just that. Well, brilliantly said, man. A perfect place to end this podcast. So, John, appreciate you again. Nice to finally meet you yes, in person, nice although we did run into friend. each other in Thank Austin. Thank you so much. Thanks for your travels, man, and good luck to you, man. Talk to you soon. Thanks a lot, Spencer. Right, John. Thank you. True Captive believes in healthcare that is personal an insurance that isn't complicated. Check them out at truecaptive.com.